Arno Kurz is an academic and activist focusing on human rights and post-conflict and post-authoritarian justice. He's also a former scholar with the Wilson Center's Global Europe program, and we're great to great to see you again. Have you back in the building? Thank you for well, having me, John. So your your project here was about alternative transitional justice spaces in post-conflict contexts, and then coincidentally, we have a Nobel Peace Prize being awarded to the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet, which certainly uh, speaks to your work. Tell us. Uh, what this group is and why they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, no, uh, frankly, it's uh, it's great that um, the um, Nobel Committee decided to um, give and award the prize to someone that was working in the background. And again, um, barely anyone knew about the work of that group. And so maybe in a nutshell, I'll tell you what that group consists of. Yes, and um, Let me how... mention first, the, the competition was steep. Angela Merkel. Correct. Pope I, Francis, John Kerry, and, Mohammed Javed Zarif. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we look at this, um, there were a number of issues with the refugee crisis, the nuclear deal that finally um, found closure, and but is still highly debated here in in domestic politics. Um, but so to decide on a little country that's still in the midst of chaos is still holding its fort and really trying to tr do a transition that is democratic as it can be in the region is very, very laudable and is, is a great um, sort of um, model for the region. And so that little quartet is basically uh, consists of four major social actors in Tunisian society. And these actors have been around for a while. And so this is also important when we um, um, go back a little in time and we look what happened during the revolution in 2010 um, in December we had the uh, food vendor um, self-immolate and then sparked the revolution and Ben Ali the president left on January 14th um, 2011 and from that period on you had massive amounts of protesters and people in the streets, first youth of course, but then because of the economic situation, you had all stratas from society that joined in for that, um, for that sort of change and that transition. And so when finally the, poli um, the politicians sat down and tried to form a unity government and transition into something that would be more stable, um, youth was left out, right? And mm -hmm. so there was a big debate that youth were the losers of this of this um, evolution and development. But then um, we had two polarizing forces. On the one hand, we had the secular forces, and then we had a voice of the Islamist power or political party, Enagda, that eventually, after years of suppression under Bourguiba and Ben Ali, um, was able to um, create a political momentum. And so in the midst of creating a constitution, um, you had political infighting between the secularists and then the Islamist um, um, force in, in Tunisian society. And um, when we look at 2013, you had two major attacks um, and political killings against opposition leaders, um, Chokri Belaid and Mohamed Bremi, um, one in February and one was killed in July. And so in this tumultuous era, you had, again, protests flaring up after the transition period from 2011 to 2013 was contentious, but calmer overall. And um, once that happened again, uh, we were sort of at the brink of chaos. And that's when the quartet stepped in. That's when the, um, the general union. So the quartet consists of the um, Tunisian um, labor union, the Tunisian union of employers, and then the uh, Tunisian um, Human Rights League, as well as um, the um, order of the Tunisian lawyers. And so when you had this chaos um, start again in the summer of 2013, you really um, had the unions step in and say, we're going to start a strike, a general strike that will um, immobilize the entire country if the political parties don't sit down and start a dialogue. This is really a model for that thing we always talk about in that the, the need for civil society to be part of an emerging democracy and it can't just be a government mandated type of uh, transition. And, and in the official uh, Nobel release, an alternative peaceful political process at a time when the country was on the brink of civil war. Would it be overstatement to say that this wouldn't have worked out as well as it did without this quartet? 
No, I, I agree. If the quartet hadn't been there, I think um, we might have also something akin to a, to a civil war. Maybe not quite to the same extent as in Libya, but um, we had contentious politics where there was a deadlock. Um, the um, opposition as well as sort of the, the government in charge um, did not want to dodge. And so um, it was necessary for sort of the, the constitution eventually to be ratified and for sort of elections to be able to take place that these social actors step in. The and birthplace of the Arab Spring continues to be a, a source of hope. It is. That it can it work. The, the impact of the award, does, is it more than symbolic or, or more than a, a good recognition of, of some good work being done? Can it have some sort of a inspirational ripple effect? I, I think it should have a ripple effect because Tunisia is in a sort a model because these actors have worked not only since yesterday, they've been around since um, the 70s with, um, with the League for, the, for Human Rights, but also the lawyers have played a very crucial role um, within Ben Ali's um, regime. They were always the ones saying no or trying to um, make sure that the rule of law within these boundaries um, gets promoted, gets, gets um, advocated for. And, and so... Um, Unfortunately, at the time in the 80s and 90s, um, these actors were isolated and Ben Ali was making sure they would stay isolated mm -hmm. so that he could um, remain in power. But the fact that when Ben Ali fled, they took this opportunity and they were then among the political forces but formed a civil society that could communicate and organize is something very, very strong. And I mean, Egypt, we unfortunately have um, the military power again in charge, but we see, we see moments where civil society can still operate. It's much more difficult. And again, civil society is not ultimately about toppling a dictator, but also making sure that society can survive what and can after function. after the toppling. Exactly. Is a, a final thought on the future of Tunisia. It's still a delicate situation. You can't be complacent. Uh, what do you see? Uh, is, are you hopeful with the pieces that are in place and the momentum that is, is being achieved? Yes, um, um, overall, I see Tunisia as a role model and problems persist with regards to um, the um, terrorist threat that we've seen across um, and the wave of new terrorist that, um, attacks that have happened in the last couple of weeks. It is difficult for um, Tunisia, especially in its southern parts or in its border parts with regards to Algeria, um, that they have to combat this, um, this threat. And the problem is then... Um, to what extent um, do we then um, cut back on civil liberties and to what extent can we then promote the democracy and to what extent do we turn into a police state again where every potential um, minority or um, underprivileged um, community or group uh, becomes a ma major target. And Questions that's, that's that are relevant problem. in a lot of countries right now, yes, unfortunately. Right. Well, uh, thank you, Arno. Good to see you again, and congratulations to the National Dialogue Quartet, and uh, thank you for coming in and talking to us about their Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. As always. Bye.